Thank you so much for that um, wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm humbled and I'm honored to uh, be here. Um, I want to thank also um, Mustafa Emmerbeyer uh, for the invitation and for uh, the administrative help uh, from Patrick Barrett, Peter, Adrian, and Jana there at the Haven Center. Um, so <clears throat> I'm assuming you can see my uh, uh, slides there. Just tell me in the chat if you can't. Um, but uh, as, as you can see, my talk is on policing. Um, and then it's drawing from some material uh, from my forthcoming book. Um, but it's not actually a, a direct response to the killing of George Floyd and the subsequent protests of the hot summer of 2020. It actually comes from events in uh, 2016 and earlier when of course in Ferguson, Missouri, protesters against racialized police violence faced a formidable police apparatus including mine resistant ambush protected vehicles or MRAP tanks, as well as SWAT teams dressed and armed as US Marines. Witnesses were unequivocal. Ferguson, they said, has turned into a war zone. And let's not forget that same year began the protests at Standing Rock, where Native American activists repeatedly clashed with America's police apparatus. In one such clash, the peaceful protesters were attacked with rubber bullets and tear gas canisters shot from grenade launchers. And they were confronted by an array of paramilitary vehicles, including Bearcats, Humvees, and at least one MRAP. So what these incidents attest to, of course, is what is sometimes called the militarization of the police. Um, and I'm gonna problematize this category throughout my talk, but it, it's helpful here to start with it. And in particular, <coughs> uh, I, I refer to Peter Kraska's often used definition uh, militarization, he says, is the process whereby civilian police increasingly draw from and pattern themselves around the tenets of militarism and the military model. And this can involve the adoption of material, cultural, organizational, and also operational aspects of the military. And so the examples from Standing Rock and Ferguson, of course, make clear that police have indeed adopted military materials as in military equipment. But it's also the case that the police have adopted many of the operational aspects and cultural aspects of the military too, right? Think SWAT units that are not only use military grade equipment, but various cultural, organizational, and operational components of the military as well. So modes of organization, military mentalities, these two must be seen as part of militarization. Um, and SWAT units are just um, one example. And note that SWAT teams are not just about public order policing. It's not just about policing events. Militarized policing um, is applied um, in, in all kinds of respects to, to daily activities and, and all kinds of policing activities. So um, my point is police militarization is clearly going on. It's multidimensional. It encapsulates, encapsulates different policing practices. And my talk um, is an attempt to make sense of this phenomenon. Um, and as I said, it comes from my book manuscript in preparation, which simply put, is a historical sociology of police militarization in the United States and Britain. And one of the bigger puzzles I'm trying to confront is exactly how and why militarization has happened. For if you understand the history of policing, you'll know that there's a sense in which it simply wasn't supposed to be this way. Police, as we know it today, was born in 1829 in London with the creation of the London Metropolitan Police, the first professional centralized uniform police department in England. And this subsequently spread to the United States where cities emulated the London model. But the London model was a particularly new idea of policing. The police uh, was meant to fight crime and manage social disorder without using the coercive tools of the military. This is the model of the so-called civil police that its creators meant as an alternative to the heavily armed police in Europe, such as the French gendarmerie, and as an alternative to the army. It's the model of policing that was a transatlantic British American innovation, a model that has insinuated a bifurcation between policing and the army that we take for granted today. That is the army is for violent coercion on enemies overseas while the police is for citizens at home. And with this bifurcation, the term civil police of course is especially fitting the word civil invokes the word citizen as in a police force of, by, and for citizens 
rather than soldiers um, and rather than for foreigners and enemies. It likewise summons the sense of civility, hence peace rather than brute force. But the militarization of policing transgresses this ideal. The police have essentially become the army on home soil. And the question is thereby begged, right? How is it that we've come to the point where the police use the same tactics, techniques, and technologies meant for enemies on citizens? How and why is it that the so-called civil police have become militarized? And so these are some of the questions that um, are motivating uh, my, my recent work and, and my book manuscript. Um, and in sharing some of that work with you today, I'm gonna make some, uh, a couple of central arguments. The first has to do with the historicization of militarization. Now the discussions in the popular sphere today tend to portray militarization as relatively new. Many point to the 1033 program by which the military is authorized to, to give surplus military equipment to police departments. Um, a lot of people point to this as the real origin which is in turn related to the war on drugs. But I wanna argue that police militarization is historically deep and goes back to the very beginnings of modern policing itself. And one of the things I show is that militarization pervades the history of police. That is, rather than militarization being recent, there have been various moments from the beginning of police history where the police have borrowed from the military, not only in terms of firearms and equipment, but of course, operations, ideology, tactics, and culture. So rather than one recent wave of militarization, I'd argue that there have been distinct moments or, or, or uh, multiple waves of militarization historically. And so over time, as more and more of these waves have occurred, there's a kind of accumulation of militarization. Police have today layers upon layers of militarized forms and practices. And the trick is that they're not often readily apparent. They're sort of hidden exactly because of this long history of accumulation. And so to fully critically understand police militarization, we have to better understand the history, peel back these layers, so to speak. <clears throat> the second point I wanna make is that militarization is not haphazard or accidental, nor are they the simple act of devious evil police officials. Rather, there are deeper patterns or logics to police militarization. Not perfect patterns, of course, history is messy, but I'm a historical sociologist and I do find certain logics at play in militarization. And one of my larger arguments is that these logics have to do with much bigger things than the police themselves in America's cities. They have to do with broader processes far beyond city limits. They have to do with the global color line. They have to do with racial logics, both at home and abroad, maintained and supported by empire. And so what I wanna show is how modern policing in the US and Britain has been intimately connected to imperialism and hence inextricably tied to racial domination. In short, my claim is this, to understand militarized policing and indeed policing as an institution, we have to recognize its coloniality. So what I'll do in the rest of my talk is elaborate some of these points by giving some examples of these waves of police militarization. <clears throat> and I wanna start uh, at the beginning with the, the founding of the London Metropolitan Police. And after that, I'll turn to some examples from the US. So the London Metropolitan Police, created in 1829. Now, as I mentioned, um, this was a, a new organization prior to the London Metropolitan Police. Policing as we know it didn't really exist for much of the period prior to this. The word police, in fact, did not refer to an institution so much as an act or function of government. And it often referred to re regulating the economy. And there were no police departments as we know them today to deal with crime. London and all of England had only a motley array of watchmen and local parish constables, many of whom were part-time volunteer or paid by fees. Um, you had groups like the Bow Street Runners and so on, but there was no real police department. <clears throat> and to deal with social disorder, whether in the form of riots or strikes, the English state had to call in the army. So the new police of London changed all of that. It brought a centralized, full-time, professionalized, uniform police that was tasked with tackling crime and regulating public order at once. And this is why it's apt to refer to the London and Anglo-American police model as the civil police. Again, it was meant to replace the army and be a force of civilians under civilian control aimed at crime prevention, as well as maintaining social order. And Robert Peel, who founded the new police, said, told parliament explicitly with this new police force, we no longer have to use military force. So this was the police force that other cities emulated. 
Um, the earliest imitators in England included Liverpool, Bristol, Birmingham, and Manchester. In the United States, <coughs> New York City directly emulated London's police as it created uh, the, New the, the New York police beginning in 1844 and 1845. Then Chicago, Boston, and Savannah, and Charleston, and other cities followed. So <clears throat> what does police militarization have to do with all of this? Well, on the one hand, as noted, the London police and the US police after that was partly meant as an alternative to the military. Um, in England, calling in the army to manage major disturbances or strikes and protests had become far too onerous and dangerous, and officials began contemplating an alternative. One of the officials who founded the London police, as I mentioned, was Sir Robert Peel, the Home Secretary of Britain at the time. And he had initially considered creating a French-style gendarmerie for England, which in France, to remind you, was a sort of national military police actually directly controlled by the military. The problem was that Peel knew that this wouldn't fly. His upper-class friends, the rising middle classes, and the English public more generally was jealous of their liberties. And if there's anything they hated, it was French-style militarism and the use of army or, or militarized uh, forces on home ground. So Peel had to create something new, a sort of third option between the dreaded military on the one hand and no coercive force at all. And the solution was the civilian controlled police, something separate from the military, but nonetheless available to and powerful enough to manage disorder and criminal activity. But here on the other hand is the tension. While the new police was indeed crafted as an alternative to the army, it was nonetheless militarized from the outset. The new police in fact borrowed not so much from the military per se, but more precisely from colonial forms of control. Now it's commonly noted uh, by many historians and scholars and police experts that Peel, who founded the new police in England, had had colonial experience. He did, he had previously served as the chief secretary of Ireland, essentially its governor. But what I wanna highlight and what I've tried to trace out in more detail is not only that Peel had served in Ireland, but also that colonial forms of coercion that he helped devise in Ireland served as his direct inspiration for what he did in London. And now in Ireland, there've been a number of different coercive colonial forms to regulate the economy before the London police. There had been, for instance, the Dublin Metropolitan Police, which was essentially an armed urban counterinsurgency force whose duties were, duties were exactly to control crime and manage disorder. Then in 1814, Peel himself created uh, what he called the Peace Preservation Force, which was a force to cover the rural districts. And this Peace Preservation Force eventually merged with the 1822 Irish Constabulary, later renamed the Royal Irish Constabulary. Many of the constabulary's officers were veterans of the army and the structure of the force followed the army's hierarchy. The constabulary were regu regularly drilled and trained in military methods. They were heavily armed, bearing pistols and bayoneted carbines, and they were housed in barracks to be called out as needed and distributed across the counties, which were divided up into policing districts. So what we have here are colonial counterinsurgency police forces, tools of the colonial state meant to suppress anti-colonial unrest and insurgencies across the territory, while also being the force to attend to criminality. And what is crucial is that these colonial forces served as the real inspiration behind and the model for the London Metropolitan Police. Peel transferred them to English soil. So for instance, the very structure of the London police was modeled after the colonial forces in Ireland just as the Irish constabulary was centralized in the hands of civilian officials, and in fact, in Peel himself in Dublin Castle, so too was command and control of the London Metropolitan Police centralized in the Home Office to be directed by Peel too, because by that time, Peel was Home Secretary. Furthermore, just as Peel's constabulary in Ireland had been organized along military lines with officers, non-commissioned officers and men, so did Peel structure the London Police in the same way. Peel, in fact, insisted that the new London Police be commanded by commissioners, not just with military experience, but more precisely with experience in Ireland. One such commissioner was this man, Charles Rowan, an Englishman who had not only been in the military, but had also served in Ireland. And in turn, <clears throat> Rowan laid out the basic operations for the new police, drawing upon his own colonial experience and knowledge of colonial military regimes. For instance, Rowan and Peel structured the new force according to a military hierarchy beneath Rowan there were a series of other officers, including 16 surgeons, a title taken directly from the army. The new force was also uniformed, just as the army was. Um, and this, to be clear, was a new thing. The constables and watches previously had not been uniform. Um, the color of the uniform was blue rather than the army's red. 
um, because Rowan and Peel did not want the police to look like an army. But notably, the Dublin Metropolitan Police had worn blue uniforms. Furthermore, many of the senior officers were taken directly from uh, colonial forces and the military. And on top of this, the entire system of police patrol had a colonial inspiration. Note that each of the new police divisions were to be patrolled by constables operating according to the beat system. By this system, the police of each section were assigned a specified territory or beat that they were to survey. The beats extended to 13 kilometers and were meant to be covered by foot in 20 minutes. Now today the term police beat or the idea of the police beat is so commonly known, we forget that it's a historical development and that in fact the London police originated it. But the London police had simply taken it from colonial experiences. And I'd argue that it was essentially a mingling of two models of coercion. First, it took from the slave patrols that had originated in the British Caribbean and the Carolinas. These had been created, of course, for inspecting slave dwellings, for arms or illicit goods, for disrupting any large gatherings of slaves or hunting fugitives, and generally keeping slaves in line. And they had been organized into what? Into territorial districts or beats, which each patrol was to cover. The Met's new beat system combined these with the British Army's recently developed light infantry units. These were highly mobile counterinsurgency units that Charles Rowan's commander in the army, Sir John Moore, had developed and used against slave rebels in St. Lucia in the 1790s, and then in 1798 to rout the Irish insurgents during the 1798 rebellion. Light infantry were also essentially what Peel's Peace Preservation Force and the Irish Constabulary were also highly mobile small units utilizing open order formations rather than close order formations to manage counterinsurgency. These colonial operations were what informed Rowan's beat system. <clears throat> Assigned distinct territories that they were to cover, the new police patrols surveyed populations as slave patrols surveyed slave populations in their territory. But as the patrols were also meant to be flexible, so that they could move across and through swaths of territory swiftly as the situation demanded and mutually supporting coming to the aid of other patrols when necessary. The beat patrols also mimicked Moore's light infantry and with them Peel's Peace Preservation Force and the Irish Constabulary. So what I'm getting at here is that the new police, despite its pretensions to be a civil police was militarized from the get-go, but more precisely it drew from colonial regimes of coercion. And it's in this sense then that the term police militarization, I'd argue is simply not as precise as it should be. Yes, the London Metropolitan Police borrowed military operations and forms. And in this sense, this was can count as militarization, but it more precisely borrowed from colonial modalities of coercion. So rather than just militarization, what we really have with the London Metropolitan Police is the coloniality of policing. While police militarization is just about appropriating military tools and practices generally, the coloniality of policing highlights the appropriation of tools, technologies, and tactics and mindsets developed and deployed at the frontiers of empire to violently repress deviance and disorder from racialized peoples deemed other and inferior. The coloniality of policing then alerts us to how policing has been shaped by a process of imperial feedback or a colonial boomerang effect as the Martinican post-colonial writer Aimé César once called it. This is the process whereby the tools of colonialism are brought back to the metropole. And I'm suggesting that this feedback or boomerang effect directly shaped modern policing from its very birth. That modern policing as we know it was born as a tool of empire and colonial control. The term militarization doesn't quite capture this. Now, um, there's much more I could say about the colonial form of this new London police, but let me turn to uh, its function. And here I wanna get at the second important way in which policing needs to be thought of in terms of coloniality. <clears throat> now, according to standard historiography, Robert Peel created the new police as a means by which to suppress crime and disorder. But what needs to be recognized is that crime and disorder were racialized at the time. What Peel and other officials were responding to when they created the police was not so much crime and disorder in general, but rather the specific perceived threat posed by colonized peoples who had been migrating to urban metropolitan centers. And in England, this meant the Irish. 
Of course, the Irish have been coming to England for as long as English rule began, but the early 1800s, just before the birth of the new police, saw heightened migration to England. This was even before the so-called Great Famine. The Union, as never before, facilitated England's colonization of Irish agriculture, a process which in turn ejected thousands of dispossessed, displaced, and destitute Irish subjects, a veritable colonial reserve army of the unemployed. The rise in cotton manufacturing and shipping industries required more cheap labor, and the Irish eventually filled the gap. In England, the numbers of the Irish rose from 40,000 in the 1780s to 590,000 by 1831. And this influx of the Irish fueled all kinds of anxieties among the English who began complaining about the so-called uh, Irish hordes. Migration thereby further fueled longstanding processes of racialization. The Irish were increasingly seen as fundamentally foreign, unalterably alien and incorrigibly inferior. While scientific racism had yet to take full hold, references to Irish biology, blood and stock increased in this period mingling with cultural explanations of Irish inferiority. Stark differentiations between Irish workers and English workers followed as countless so-called experts and officials and employers claimed that the Irish were physically predisposed to certain types of labor, that they were less civilized, more disorderly, and more violent than their English counterparts. And this of course justified their low pay and low position in the occupational hierarchy. The Irish were in short the racialized subproletariat of England's booming economy. And what all of this meant is that when Peel and other police reformers beginning in the 1820s and through the 1830s spoke about needing a new police to deal with rising crime and disorder, the Irish were often their implicit and sometimes explicit reference point. They saw the Irish as inherently lawless and criminal and most officials blamed the Irish for the seeming increase in crime. They also connected Irish migrants to the increased potential for uprisings in London, and, and around the manufacturing districts of the country. <clears throat> For in the English mind, the Irish were seen as inherently disorderly and violent. And this perceived racial threat is what had compelled the creation of the Irish colonial forces after all, like the Irish constabulary. And now in 1820s, the barbarians were seemingly at the gates. Indeed, as many migrant Irish had joined the growing worker rebellions across England, they were seen as not only at the gates, but flooding through them. In 1828, a quarterly review article blamed crime on the Irish while also predicting future rebellion. The Irish conspirators of 1798, this article said, were sending their men to England to incite English workers and were acting as the Guy Foxites of Ireland, plotting to quote, make a glorious bonfire of London. Even black radicals were added to the threat as the press seized upon the fact that William Cuffey, an English worker of African origin, had become a leading figure in the Chartist movement. And the London press complained that the London Chartists were not in fact an English movement threatening order, but essentially an Irish movement led by an African. In short, the formation of the London police in 1829 was not a response to crime and disorder in general, not a response to workers in general, but in particular, a response to the Irish problem. Dr. James Kay's ideas on the Irish in England exemplify this thinking. The existing constable and watch system, Kay declared, was fine when the population of England's towns had been mostly English. But with the towns flooded with importations from Ireland, as he called them, the constable watch system, which had been devised for the government of one much more advanced in the social scale, he said, logically falters. Therefore, he concluded expedients which might be efficient in restraining vice and preventing crime among a purely English population failed to produce these results in towns in which the Irish exist in great numbers mixed with the native inhabitants. What was needed, Kay eventually suggested, was an entirely new type of policing system. And so it was fitting that to deal with the Irish problem in England, you use the same methods you had used in colonial Ireland. And this I'd argue is why Peel and Rowan and other police reformers created the new police and why they modeled it after Ireland's colonial forces. While they certainly hoped to manage rising crime and disorder, also on their mind was the need to manage the fact of thousands of colonized peoples invading their putatively sacred metropolitan spaces. It's therefore fitting that my sample of arrests made by the London Met in the 1830s reveals that the Irish were disproportionately arrested. While the Irish born and children of Irish born immigrants made up about 5.75 of London's population, the Irish often made up over 10% of all arrests on average 
and at times constituted up to even more than that, mostly for petty crimes like theft. The Irish, therefore, were arrested at double the rate they should have been if they were not over-policed. Now, in other cities like Manchester and Liverpool, you see the same colonial dynamics underlying the creation of the new police in those cities. Irish had gone to those cities as well, not least to fuel the, the, the cotton economy. So you also see this um, in the United States with some variations. So let me now turn to the United States. Um, in my book, I discussed the founding of the new police in New York City in 1805, which was the first city in the US to fully adopt the new civil police model. But I also discussed Savannah, Georgia. So let me discuss this one. And here we'll see a similar process that we've seen in London, but with slight variation. Now in Savannah, the new police force was created in 1854 after Northern cities like New York and Boston had created their police departments modeled after London. But Savannah's is of note because it was the very first modern civil police force created in the American South. And actually other cities in the South were soon inspired by it as well. And in Savannah, as in London, what prefigured the creation of the new police was a perceived rise in crime and disorder. And as in London, the threat was seen as coming from the racialized uh, subproletariat. The city had been growing and had become an important port for shipping raw cotton to England. This attracted laborers, such as slaves, being hired out by their masters, many living in the city away from their masters. You also had increasing numbers of freed African-Americans coming to the city, and indeed many Irish who began coming in large numbers in the late 1840s and early 1850s. These Irish and African-Americans thus became part of the transatlantic American and British cotton empire. Black labor picked the cotton, Irish workers transported, stored, and loaded it onto ships in Savannah destined for Liverpool, where other Irish workers unloaded the cotton and sent it to the rest of England, like Manchester, to be turned into textiles by whom? By yet more Irish workers. And all of this created the conditions for, in Savannah, the city's white elite to racialize crime and disorder. White elites perceived the new blame, uh, rise in crime and they blamed the new Irish immigrants and the African-American population for creating it. They saw the farmed out slave population as prone to criminality without control because they were not under the direct supervision of their masters. They saw the Irish as inherently violent and prone to riot and disorder. Authorities labeled the Irish, uh, the areas where the Irish and the African-American population lived together as those where the lawless elements, as they put it, live. And many even feared outright insurrection. And so as in London, they decided to create a new policing system to meet the perceived threats. The new police that they created drew directly from the London model as officials were familiar with it. And the Savannah police ended up as a bureaucratic hierarchical centralized full-time uniform police force with beats and military rank, very much like London's. <clears throat> there was one difference. The Savannah police was different from actually both the London model and from other cities in the North in the fact that they were fully armed with guns. The London police and even the New York and Boston and other Northern police forces were not in fact initially armed with guns. Instead, they only had truncheons. So the arming of the Savannah police from the get-go was an innovation. And it came from the local legacy of colonial coercion. That is the slave patrols, which had also been heavily armed. Furthermore, the Savannah police had a special mounted unit, officers on horseback for heightened mobility. This too was new. Neither the London nor the New York police were mounted. They did the patrols on foot. And this feature of the Savannah police was also taken from the slave patrols. And it was also likely inspired by the US Army's counterinsurgency forces in Texas, such as the mounted Texas Rangers. And indeed, just as police officials in London like Rowan and Peel had served in Ireland, many of the officials in Savannah responsible for the new police had served in the Mexican-American War in Texas. So what we see here again, despite this variation, is the same pattern. The new civil police in Savannah was militarized from the get-go. It was created in response to racialized threats and had a colonial form. Again, this is the coloniality of policing. Now, of course, I've only discussed the origins of policing so far. Um, so before I close, let me turn to one more example from the US at a later period in time to show again, this larger story of waves. And this has to do specifically with the early 20th century United States. So we had a first wave with the founding of police. And now I wanna to turn to the early 20th century uh, in the United States to, to show it another additional wave of militarization. <clears throat> um, now, in a recent article of mine in the American Journal of Sociology, I discussed this in much greater detail. Um, and you can look at that for more details, but let me here just summarize the key points. 
First off, we have to understand that this was a formative moment for policing in the US, often called the reform era or the modernization of policing. Now, prior to this period, as I've said, police departments across the country had reformed along the London model, beginning with Boston and New York. And so already embedded in these police departments was this Irish model and therefore a kind of coloniality. But around the turn of the century, 20th century, some important new developments unfolded. Police departments professionalized further, they rationalized and expanded their capabilities as never before. They developed new methods of criminal identification, they developed various specialized mobile squads, <clears throat> for instance, whereas most patrolmen in the 19th century covered their own small part of the city, police departments in this period began outing, adding mounted patrols like such as had been seen in Savannah. Um, but these mounted patrols used horses and bicycles and later motorcycles or cars in order to deploy rapidly and cover more territory. This is the Philadelphia mounted police um, and all across the country, not just in the South, um, police were increasingly mounted. This is one of the reasons why this era is called by historians the modernization era. Police essentially became much more powerful than before, in essence, uh, creating the powerful police departments we know today. But this too was actually a kind of militarization and more precisely, a colonial counterinsurgentization. One of the leaders of the modernization movement was this man, August Vollmer. He was the chief of police at the Berkeley Police Department starting in 1905. And he was one of the ones responsible for innovating all of these uh, police developments from mounting patrolmen to setting up the first police training school to using algorithms and new records in criminal identification systems. Vollmer is known for all of these things, which is why textbooks today, look at any textbook, ask actually any police officer, and they know him as the father of modern, police, uh, of modern policing. <clears throat> but what made Vollmer and the Berkeley Police Department so innovative? Well, a large part of the answer lies with Vollmer himself, and then the fact that Vollmer, before he became police chief, had been part of America's colonial empire. Specifically, he had served in America's largest colony at the time, the Philippines. Remember, the US had defeated the Spanish during the Spanish-American War of 1898 and then took the Philippines as its largest colony. Filipinos had resisted, leading to the Philippine-American War uh, from 1898 to 1902. Um, and Vollmer had been involved in all of this. He had been in the US Army in 1898, fought the Spanish in the Philippines, and then as part of the American occupying force in Manila, he was among the few soldiers charged with policing the city of Manila. After this, Vollmer joined the Americans' counterinsurgency efforts against the Filipino rebels, and he had been handpicked to join a new elite counterinsurgency unit, seen here, charged with penetrating the interior to conquer and capture rebel leaders. The arrow here is where it is Vollmer. Now, only after all of this did Vollmer return to Berkeley and become chief of police in 1905. And, um, of course, those of you there in Wisconsin might know Alfred McCoy. He's written about how the Philippines uh, theater served to um, create uh, the, 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 the FBI and so on. What I'm here showing is an earlier moment where, in fact, local police were directly influenced by the Philippines-American War. Vollmer brought with him back home many of the colonial counterinsurgency techniques that he had been exposed to in the Philippines. His idea of mounting police forces, for instance, came partly from the army's uh, counterinsurgency efforts in the interior of the Philippine archipelago. This was a more direct appropriation of these uh, mobile military units than it was from the Southern um, slave patrols. Vollmer also borrowed intelligence methods from the US Army's counterinsurgency efforts to gather data intelligence on Filipino insurgents. Um, he, in essence, he likened criminals to Filipino rebels and so used the same tactics that were used on the latter against the former. There's lots of examples. I've just mentioned a couple. Here's uh, one in particular of note is pin mapping. Vollmer is known as one of the, if not the innovators to come up with pin mapping. What's pin mapping? Well, this involves charting the locations of crimes in order to detect hotspots of criminal activity, predict future crime and deploy forces accordingly. This for instance is an example from Vollmer's papers in this case from LA. Pins are placed in the areas where crime had occurred, and then you can mobilize police forces and concentrate force in that area. Today, this is called spot mapping or predictive policing. It's, you know, it's like a shiny new toy that's brand new, but in fact, um, this comes from uh, Vollmer. Um, this is, for example, an example in the 90s from uh, computer-generated uh, Philadelphia hotspot policing. And Vollmer adopted this technique from his days in the Philippine-American War. The US Army, in fact, had innovated pin mapping techniques specifically to track the movements of Filipino insurgents 
to locate their camps in the vast terrain of central Luzon and embark upon their search and destroy mission. Balmer simply applied this tactic to policing. He referred to it as, quote, the art of making war on the map, unquote. As he later explained to an audience of police officers uh, for years, ever since the Spanish-American War days, I've studied military tactics and used them to good effect in running up crooks. We're conducting a war, a war against the enemies of society, and we must never forget that. And I don't think it's an accident that in this period in the progressive era, it's when you start seeing this language of war on crime first emerge and policing as involved in a war, uh, you see this emerge in, in this period. So here again, what we have is the colonial boomerang at work, and it served to further militarize the police. The so-called reform movement led by Vollmer was in fact a form of militarization. And here too, racial logics were at play. Um, and let me discuss this again before I close. You know, this, this reform movement, this modernization movement that happened not only in Berkeley, but all across the country had been prefigured by new patterns of immigration uh, across the country. <clears throat> in the Midwest and the East, for example, you had Im European immigrants coming into work for the rising industrial sector, but you also had the beginnings of African-American migration from the North to South. In the South itself, more and more African-Americans were heading from the countryside to the cities. In the West, where Balmer was, Asian exclusion acts had slowed the influx of Chinese or Japanese, but illegal immigration continued and many Asians migrated internally, moving across the region, particularly moving into urban areas. And to many white officials, of course, these new immigrants and migrants were not the most welcoming sight. White officials claimed that they brought a rise uh, in crime and a decay in public morality and the specter of lawlessness and disorder, such as with this image of, of the Chinese. So demographic changes generated in turn a sense of racialized threat among white officials and elites. And in their eyes, a more powerful police was the way to deal with it. And more specifically, using the tactics from the colonies was the best way to deal with it. After all, those colonies had also been filled with peoples racialized as inferior, as morally suspect, as having inherent tendencies towards vice uh, and disorder and illegality. And so for white officials, it was perfectly appropriate and logical to import colonial methods for the purposes of domestic policing. Put simply, racial homologies or the racialization of crime and disorder generated militarization through imperial feedback. In fact, it was by this very logic that August Vollmer in Berkeley had been chosen as police chief in the first place. Previously, the Berkeley and the neighboring Oakland community had been fretting about the increase of Chinese migrants from elsewhere in California. They had been especially appalled at the Chinese gangsters and their opium dens that had been purportedly corrupting white morality and worse yet, young white women. They therefore urged Vollmer to become police chief exactly because of his experience in the Philippines where he had already dealt with the so-called oriental race. According to one account at the time, Vollmer's friends said to him about the new police chief job, it will be a fighting job for whoever takes it, they told him. That's why we want you, Gus. You were a pretty good fighting man when you went up against those goo goos over in the islands. Goo goos, of course, was the derogatory name for Asians and, and it was particularly used on Filipinos at the time. So again, same logic. Let me conclude then with a few points. <clears throat> First, the story I've told here about the racial and colonial origins of police helps us to solve the puzzle of the militarization of the civil police that I referred to at the beginning of the talk. As noted, the civil police theoretically is for protecting citizens. Therefore, policing should be peaceful, indeed civil. The military colonial police, meanwhile, are aimed at repressing ostensibly inferior subjects and enemies, and therefore they employ uncivil tools, i.e. violent militaristic methods or militaristic tactics. The militarization of policing through imperial feedback means that these boundaries are transgressed. Citizens are treated like colonial subjects, but why? How is it that the so-called civil police have come to treat citizens as if they are enemies and colonial subjects using the same means and methods that they use on the latter? Well, now that we understand the coloniality of policing, we can see the answer. The answer is plain. The civil police adopt militaristic colonial modes of coercion on citizens and treat those citizens like colonial subjects because police see citizens as colonial subjects. And the primary modality for this categorical transformation, the key social code by which this miraculous transubstantiation of citizens into subjects occurs is racialization. By racialization, citizens are constructed to be inferior, dangerous, and violent, just like colonized peoples, 
This in turn warrants, if not demands, the importation of militarized tools, tactics, and technologies that had been originally deployed on colonized peoples abroad in the first place. Second point, while I've only given a few examples here of militarization, I've only referred to a couple of waves of militarization, um, we could have discussed many more. Of course, SWAT teams are a, a good example. These are of course heavily militarized units and they emerged initially in the Los Angeles Police Department in the late 1960s. And here too, the logic of racial homologies and imperial feedback was at work. One of the founders of the Los Angeles SWAT unit was John Nelson, a military veteran who had served in an elite recon unit called Force Recon. And he and other founders of SWAT created the new units in response to the ghetto riots of Watts, Detroit, and Newark. Uh, Gates, who was also one of the founders, had in fact referred to those riots by African-Americans as guerrilla warfare, thereby making powerful analogies between the riots on the one hand and on the other, the anti-colonial rebellions in Vietnam and British Africa and elsewhere around the world at the time. And so in response, Nelson, Gates, and their colleagues turned to the military for ideas about how to manage these racialized threats. And they turned specifically to the Army's special elite counterinsurgency units that had been deployed in Vietnam. As a result, they created the first SWAT unit in the country, which was, as we all know, uh, then quickly emulated around the United States. And there are more recent examples, too, in many U.S. cities in recent years, for instance, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars have, divide, have, have advised law enforcement or even served as law officers themselves. What they have been trying to do is use counterinsurgency techniques from Iraq or Afghanistan and deploy them in order to police gangs in minority neighborhoods. Um, this has received a lot of uh, press. Um, and again, here we find the same logic of racial homologies and deportation at work. For example, one prominent proponent of this approach, the veteran Kevin Kit Parker noted that quote, gangs rely on the passive support of the population the same way Al-Qaeda would go into Sudan. So Parker's goal, as he stated, was to quote, work with the police to develop technologies, tactics, procedures to use against gangs, unquote. Some of those technologies include new computer algorithms and surveillance software. And again, what we see here is how racial homologies fuel imperial feedback and therefore police militarization. Third and finally to conclude, Given this long history of imperial feedback and police militarization, given the coloniality of policing, it actually should not be a surprise that police act as they do, whether in Ferguson or Minneapolis or here in the streets of Chicago. Nor it should even be surprised that there have been so many police shootings of African-Americans in the United States. For not only does militarization mean that the police adopt the tactics and techniques of colonial regimes, it also means that they adopt the mentality of colonial coercion as well. Borrowing colonial forms and tactics for policing invites the police to imagine US cities as zones of colonial conquest and imagine urban residents as insurgents. When police forces more recently adopt the strategies of American military forces in Iraq, the police are invited to see citizens as potential terrorists and enemies compelled to imagine that danger lurks behind every corner and in each passing face. We sociologists have long known, of course, that criminals are constructed by society as evil deviants or enemies of society. My point here is that police militarization, or more precisely, the coloniality of policing, creates something more. It creates the image of criminals not just as enemies of society, but as dangerous, violent, warlike, inferior peoples akin to those enemy of, enemies of society America tries to violently suppress and exploit abroad. In other words, what I'm saying is that this phenomenon of policing citizens, especially those who are black and brown, as enemies on occupied soil is no coincidence, given the profound relationship between empire and policing. For given that relationship, a mentality of racialized colonial violence has been deeply baked into our policing institutions, such that racialized acts of police violence do not so much express a deviation from a policing norm, but rather its very essence. So it's not that policing has sometimes been militarized and sometimes racialized. It's not, for instance, that those images of Minneapolis or Ferguson that I began with are somehow unique or tragic aberrations. Rather, policing, born out of colonial suppression, birthed from empire, has been at its core an intrinsically military, imperial, and hence racial project. And so any attempt to reform policing today would need to recognize this core feature of this otherwise seemingly neutral and seemingly reformable institution that we miscall the civil police. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Julian. That was an absolute, absolutely fascinating presentation. Really, really enjoyed that. Uh, and I'm really glad that we've now got uh, a little over half an hour for questions and answers to talk about this more. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, questions in groups of three, if possible. Uh, so there's two ways you can ask a question. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this, uh, but I'll go over it for, you, for any of you who haven't been to our sessions before. But first, you can raise your hand virtually. To do that, click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and then click on the raise hand icon. I'll call your name and ask you to unmute. Alternatively, if you'd rather not speak yourself, you can type a question into the chat and I'll uh, read it out for you. If you would like to ask a question yourself, I'd ask that you please um, uh, turn your video on uh, when you do. So, has anyone got a question? Uh, and I've got Steve Lee. Hi, sorry, I had technical difficulties. That was fantastic, <clears throat> fantastic talk. I, I learned a lot, although I was unfortunately on a little bit late. So maybe you've already covered this. I'm wondering if you could uh, connect um, racialization and uh, colonization um, uh, to capitalism and how you see that connection um, because it seems like the uh, colonial subjects are one group that's being oppressed and exploited by capitalism and the, the working class and poor in the home country are also being suppressed so uh, oppressed and exploited for the benefit of capital so just wondering if you could comment on that thank you very much thank you very much actually could i take that one since it's it's kind of a big one I'll sure, take that one first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for that question. It's a very important question. It, it gives me the opportunity to elaborate a little bit, um, which I didn't get a chance to do given the lack of time. Um, essentially, um, there is a direct connection between this racialization and capitalism. Um, and it's not just that colonial subjects abroad are fitted into a global capitalist hierarchy. It's that the Police, when they militarize, as I've suggested, in response to racialized threats, are responding to, are militarizing in order to control racialized populations in the United States who are themselves what I would think of as the sub-proletariat, right? So when um, the, 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 the birth of the new police in England happens in, in London and Manchester, it's responding to the Irish. The Irish, of course, are brought in to work in the cotton economy at the lowest rungs of the economy, right? They are um, subject to, to uh, not only the, the, the lowest paid jobs, um, but also massive um, temporary work. They are the fluctuating workers. They end up being vagrants and then working for a while. So this is you know the, the, the sub-proletariat of capitalism. I would say the same thing in the US when these uh, uh, immigrants pose a perceived racialized threat or migrants pose a re perceived racialized threat, including urban migrants coming to the cities um, in the South, such as uh, African Americans moving to cities and police militarized in response, they are responding to this sub proletariat, right? So this, there is a class dimension to this, but it's not the kind of class dimension that is typically discussed in the classic Marxist historiographies of policing. The classic historiograph uh, Marxist historiography of policing, such as Sidney Sydney Herring's wonderful work, um, it argues that police is essentially um, violent in response to the industrial working class. Um, what Herring and others of the tradition fail to know is that there's, it's not so much the industrial working class which, by which they're talking about white working class that the police are responding to. I would argue and I'm finding that they're responding more specifically initially to this racialized subproletariat, right? So it's a particular group within the working class. So that's where I see the connection as well. And thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. And thank you for your Thanks very much. So, okay, I've got one more hand. Amy, I'll ask you to unmute and turn your video on. Hi, yeah, that was um, that was really awesome. It was uh, great to hear. I, I like all your work, I'll just say. Um, I, I love that kind of global transnational and, and trans-imperial approach. One of the things that I look at in, in my work that, um, I think intersects with yours is the, the increasing policing of women's bodies and in, in a different way as part of imperialism. 
and I know that you might not have had the time and space to look at this for, for a book um, specifically focusing on the development of militarized policing, but I wondered if you had seen any parallels or discussions of controlling women of color and migrating women and the way in which their bodies needed to be controlled, um, whether it was through policing or through like policing referring them to some type of services. Thanks very much, Amy. So, Julian, you've got that question, and I've got two more questions for you, both from the chat. Although one has been one of them has been <laughs> sent directly to me. So, the first one should be a fairly easy one to answer. Uh, this is Barry, uh, who says, "Thanks from Scotland, Julian. Fascinating. When will the book be published? It's nice to see some fellow Scots in the audience." Uh, and there's another message from Franklin, which is, is there anything folk can do to push back against the increasing militarization of police and border control? So three questions for you. Great, thank you so much. So let me take the, the, the easy one first, which is whether will the book be published? Um, well, that's actually not an easy one. It's a difficult one because the book will be published uh, when I finish it. And when that happens, uh, my editor will be more than happy. To, uh, to see the book. So I'm, I'm in the, I'm probably finishing up um, very soon. So it's, it's not yet um, scheduled, but I hope it'll be out um, soon. Thanks for your interest. Um, and I'll certainly let uh, the British and the UK world know. Um, the question about um, women's policing women's bodies. I think Amy, this is a really important question. It's definitely not something that I was able to um, to get into in my research. Where say gender broadly does fit in is that I think in these racialized threats, these moments, they're almost moral panics, which I'm suggest trigger this imperial feedback. Um, a lot of it is around women's bodies, right? So um, the concern about these Chinese gangsters in California is also a concern about um, how women, white women, are being um, subjected to white op uh, to, to opium, and um, the, the the white elites who are complaining about these Chinese opium dens um, go at great lengths to describe with great horror how these white women are being um, drugged by these Asian men, and how we have to protect the morality of white women. You see the same thing on the East Coast with Philadelphia in the period, and and white prostitution, so-called white slavery. Um, and then, you know, the, the moral panic and the racialized threat sort of um, is also gendered. There's a gendered component to that. Um, so that's really the only way in which I've seen it come up. But I think it's an important area that needs definitely needs further exploration. I just um, haven't seen much more than that. Um, I hopefully you and uh, your, your work can, can fill in some of those in, in gaps. Um, <clears throat> lastly, what can we do to push back against militarization? Um, this is a really important question, and I think that we could have an entire uh, longer discussion about it. Um, I will say, first of all, that, that the, the struggle against police militarization needs to recognize that police militarization is much deeper, as I've suggested in this talk, than military equipment. Okay? There's right now, of course, uh, momentum to roll back the 1033 program which was created in the 1990s. It's the program that allows for surplus military equipment to go to police. And there's been a lot of movement from Black Lives Matter, um, from democratic uh, officials uh, and, and politicians who are actually are aligning with um, people on the right who don't do this, uh, who don't like this either. They don't wanna see tax dollars going to this. Um, and there's alignments to, to, to actually push back against the 1033 program. And that's fine, but I, my concern is that that is a very narrow view of police militarization, right? Police militarization is not just happening through the 1033 program, and it's not just happening um, in terms of military equipment. We also have uh, police officers, something I didn't mention, um, all around the country going to Israel to be trained by the Israeli Defense Forces um, under the guise of the war on terror. And so the war on terror has also been a new um, sort of modality for militarization, and we got to be alert to those programs as well. Um, and a lot of that is a local struggle, right? Durham, North Carolina, the, the city has um, actually, they were able to pass legislation that would prevent Durham officials from going to Israel to train, right? So the, there are ways in which you can institute at the local level 
um, policies that will push back against police militarization. And again, we have to recognize that police militarization is not only about the equipment. I also think it's dangerous in, in, in the way in which it adopts these mindsets that I'm talking about as well and, and, and training and all these other things. So I think we have to have a more capacious understanding of what militarization involves in order to fight it. Secondly, and lastly, um, you know, to me, fighting police militarization is essentially fighting policing itself. Like part of my, what I've learned from this talk I mean, what I've learned from my research that I'm describing in my talk is that policing and militarization go hand in hand. The institution of modern policing as we know it is inextricably militarized from the get-go. And so I would argue you cannot um, abolish police militarization without abolish policing as we know it. So I, I, would, I tie, I think about the anti-police militarization movement as necessarily connected to, it should be connected to, the the abolish movement um, and 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 I'm I'm very much um, interested in in just getting people to think harder about how policing as an institution has always been militarized so that when we think about our strategies against militarization it has to be part of a larger project against policing generally and 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 the institution of policing as we know it and at the same time it has to also be against empire and and. Milita the military, military as well. So the struggles overseas and the struggles against um, empire have to be connected with the struggles against police militarization and with police violence at home. Thanks so much, Julian. Okay, um, we've got someone uh, ready to speak and that is Yubin. Yubin, I'll ask you to unmute and turn your video on if you can. Hi, um, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. I thought, um, yeah, it was great. Um, I, I have uh, actually three questions, if that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, or you can just choose one um, if, if there are other people um, wondering. Um, I guess uh, my first question is I wanted to ask about maybe like the reverse case. Um, so in uh, countries or spaces where uh, there wasn't uh, extensive well, I don't know if that exists, but uh, extensive colonial or um, or empire-based uh, military routes to uh, policing. Um, if if the police are are different, um, just because policing seems to be such a, a universal um, kind of modern bureaucratic tool, um, and yeah, so, so that was one question. Um, my second question, I wanted to ask uh, uh, a little bit about um, uh, your thoughts on how, uh, on um, police unions. So one um, kind of, well, I'm a labor scholar, so I think about unions a lot. And um, one of the things that people do talk about is the, the political power um, that police unions hold in big metropolitan cities, like you know, I'm in um, New York City right now, Eric Adams um, is the mayor and, and the PBA has uh, historically had significant uh, police power. And I'm wondering how um, you see that factoring into uh, the, your argument. So if, if it's kind of, uh, yeah, if it's, if it just happened to be that way or, um, it, it developed along the way, or police unions are also kind of um, a, a function of um, of racial capitalism. Uh, and I guess my my last question was, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Um, I guess like right now, um, maybe this is also very specific, but uh, there's. Uh, the the racial aspect to policing, um, for example, in New York City, is around, um, you know, stop Asian hate. We need to increase more uh, police violence, and um, so like kind of coming up to the contemporary times. Um, I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts are around this. Thank you so much. This was uh, such a great talk, and I look forward to reading your book. And I love all your other work too. So. Thank you. Well, those are three great questions. So I don't, I think we can hand straight back to you, Julian. All right. Yeah. Thank you for those. Um, 
So first of all, um, police unions, that's a very important question. Police unions, I think, are an understudied, under theorized aspect of policing. Uh, my friend Stuart Schrader is starting to do some wonderful work on this. Um, and I myself um, really don't, uh, haven't come across it too much in my work. Um, there is issues with police unionization in, in Britain that I've come across. Um, and, and, and there's some issues there. But um, it's, it's a larger history that um, I, I unfortunately can't say too much about. Um, your first question about sort of other countries and militarization. I mean, one thing I'll say is that the story that I've told is essentially one of importation, but um, the larger story is of course, a whole process of importation, exportation, a whole circulation of not only colonial tactics being developed overseas and then brought home, but also them going back out um, and again, Stuart Schrader and others have done some work on this uh, in the 20th century, uh, how you know, the US had created policing programs to advise and, 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 and create police, uh, policing uh, departments in post-colonial countries. Um, and you know, they, they're looking at the, the period of the 50s and 60s onward, but um, I would argue that that process of circulation between colonial and metropolitan policing goes back to the very beginning of policing. That's a large part of my argument. And so it's a whole process of circulation. I, of course, have only focused on the, the, the one side, the boomerang effect, but a, a, a more complete history of volume two, as it were, would um, need to look at the whole process of circulation. Um, and, and, and it's a complex story. And that's how um, policing have, and it's one of the roads by which police uh, abroad have been militarized as well, and, and have many of these same characteristics that <clears throat> that um, police in the United States and, and Britain have. And I think that one of the problems with policing research has been that there's been too much of a divide between these two areas. And in Britain, there's a longstanding tradition of there's metropolitan policing, there's colonial policing, and they're not the same thing and they're studied separately. And that of course is beginning to be broken down analytically and rightfully so that we need to think about them as in the same field. And I'd say the same thing with the US. We need to think of US policing as, as, as developing simultaneously an interaction with colonial policing and then with post-colonial policing. And that there's a whole global field that goes back to the, uh, the history goes back to the very beginning of modern policing. So um, that's a larger story there that I can't tell, but that is my, my story is telling um, one part of that. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I guess the, your last question, I'm, I'm not sure it's about New York and policing today. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. If you wanna rephrase that for me, that would be helpful. Uh, I guess it was just more and more general um, uh, political -y question, but uh, about, um, so, so in, in New York, uh, there's an increase in um, hate crimes against Asian oh, and Asian yeah. Americans, yeah. and yeah. that is being yeah. used as a... Yeah. Uh, uh, right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, I think this, you know, um, as someone who, you know, who is, considers himself part of the Asian American community in some ways, um, this is an issue also in Chicago, especially here at the University of Chicago. There's been um, violence against, um, criminal violence against Asian American students and so on. And just in the fall, Asian American students got together and protested and demanded more police, um, police funding and, and, and more policing essentially. And of course, the problem with that is um, not that you know, we shouldn't worry about criminal violence happening to us. The problem with that is that the solution is totally uh, unproblematized because the solution is always more policing, right? Um, and that's not a solution. I mean, if you you know look at the the work on policing, all the wonderful work of Alex Vitale and all these other people behind the uh, the abolish and defund movements, um, what they're telling us and reminding us is that this knee jerk reaction of more policing to deal with crime is the problem. Right? And and so we need to think about longer longer term solutions than just throwing more money at policing and having police uh, increase violence. I mean, if you want to stop violence, you can't do it by um, getting the police to empower them to do more violence, right? I, I, we need to include police violence in our counts of violence in cities. And, and we need to think about police violence as part of, as part of a, a larger fabric of violence and, and harm that we need to address. And so clearly when you think about that, then just trying to call for more policing to deal with crime is, is the wrong way to go. It's dangerous, it harms, it creates more harms, particularly for the communities in which we live. 
um, then it does good. And and so that that's the one that's my initial response to your to your point. I mean, I don't think we need to stop Asian hate by more policing. Let's put it that way. We need to do it, but we need to stop Asian hate by thinking about the conditions under which these these acts of criminal violence occur, and we need to address those structural conditions and changing policing, adding more police forces is not gonna do it. It's just gonna make things worse. Thanks very much. So next up, next up we have Max felker Cantor. I'll ask you to unmute and turn your video on. Hi, Julian. Thank you for that um, great talk um, and really interesting kind of work on militarization. You kind of answered one of my, you know, the initial question I had actually in the ways that we need, how we should think about kind of local police in their development of their own ideas and practices and how it interacts then with this boomerang effect. You kind of said that already in that last answer. So the second thing that got me thinking if we push military, police militarization back, right, and I'm coming, you know, as someone who writes about the history of policing, um, which I totally agree with, I totally buy your argument, right, but where do we then see change over time in the nature of policing and militarization? Like, if you're taking this long sweep, can you talk a little bit about where we then start to see how police militarization and this imperial feedback looks different with SWAT than it did earlier? or different later, right? That, you know, where do we get, because I could see how just saying we're gonna push it all the way back, then we get this kind of sameness over time. So I'd be interested in just kind of hearing what you think about that, but thank you again, this was great. Yeah. Thanks, that is a big question. Do you mind if I take that? Of course, go for it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So Max, first of all, I, I come across your dissertation and your work and it's really, it's, more, it's informing some of what we're doing. So it's, it's really a pleasure to, to hear from you and thank you for your work. Um, so the way I, I'm thinking about this, is, uh, the way I answer your question is, right, I really am trying to avoid a kind of portrayal of police militarized power as the singular thing that's homogeneous across time. I, definitely what I'm trying to get away from. And uh, one of the, and there's a couple ways in which I'm doing that historically. One is, again, I'm identifying these moments or when there's waves of militarization and I identify three or four historically in each country and, and, and so what I'm conceiving of is there's a sort of historical dynamics where you have militarization, a moment or a wave of militarization usually driven by some kind of moral panic or racialized threat. And then you have relative stability. Um, those techniques and tactics are then used on populations and then they are used obviously on white populations as well because these are modular tactics, but you don't really have a lot of activity in terms of new militarization until a new racialized threat or series of events occur, which then Get everyone talking about we need more policing and we need to turn to you know these 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 uh, tactics these new tactics overseas and so there are these distinct moments as the history punctuated by these moments of militarization and each I argue is triggered by a kind of racialized threat um, so there's a definitely that's the history there that I'm trying to capture but the other thing in terms of changes is that each one of these moments um, when police turn to uh, imperial tactics or colonial tactics um, they're turning to new tactics because the empire itself is changing over time right. And so each of these moments when these waves of militarization happen, the empire itself has developed, it's developed new forms and new tactics um, and, and new things. So, you know, by the, by the time SWAT emerges, um, you actually had already in New York, for example, um, the tactical patrol force, which themselves are sort of based on these new um, specialized uh, colonial counterinsurgency units that had been really developed only in the um, you know, 30s and 40s and 50s in the empire, both the British and American empires. And so those forms then get adopted, right? So you also have changes in the content of, of what's being uh, adopted. And those changes are, 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 are corresponding to the content of the uh, imperial military regime, as I, as I talk about, because this is a repertoire of a diversity of tactics and tools that change over time and expand and, and, and they have all these developments. And so, you know, the recent, most recent kind of developments taken from counterinsurgency are different from the early 20th century. Now it's um, reliance upon um, social networking models and computer algorithms and surveillance software that were developed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's the kind of shiny new toys that are being adopted to deal with particularly the, the so-called gang problem. Um, and so, each of these ways have different types of militarized tactics and technology. Thank you for your question. I hope that gives you a sense of what I'm trying to do. 
Well, there's a question in chat that really follows on from that very directly. And actually, you've actually already started to answer it, but perhaps you might want to flesh it out a bit more. Um, and the question is from Seymour Clean, uh, Clear Lee, who says, a question about anticipating new tactics and forms of policing in the 21st century, perhaps policing beyond militarization. With respect to recent mobilization of the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa, Canada, can you comment on any new formulations of policing, such as the freezing of bank accounts of activists? Can we anticipate this freezing of bank accounts as a normalization of these new forms of compulsion and force by Ooh. police? And I've also got a question from Adrian, so I'll bring her in. Thanks. I think it um, dovetails nicely. I'm just curious um, if you can um tell us what you think or, or, or has there been in your research um, any indication of changes to the what I'm going to call the psychological weaponry de deployed by um, policing and or colonial um, colonial forces um, and what you found in your research I would love to hear more about that great thank you these are great questions um, the question about uh, from Seymour on the freezing of bank accounts of activists and so on. I, that's a great question. I actually haven't seen much about that. And I, so I guess my answer is I, I don't really know, um, but I think that we can think about some of these new tactics um, that involve um, these technologies as a kind of militarization, because a lot of them are developed, um, have been developed overseas and perfected overseas in, in particularly the, um, the Middle East campaigns about freezing bank accounts in particular. I don't. I don't know. I think that's a great question. I hope some people, someone could look into those particular tactics. Um, and Adrian, um, some of the, the sort of the, the mentality. I mean, I, that's a great question. I think one of the things that I've, <coughs> you see uh, more recently with uh, policing is uh, you know, and partly in response to the failure of police to really deal with crime effectively and to, and also a, partly a response to criticisms of the police is of course, new forms of community policing where the police embed themselves um, in communities. And the idea is to get the community members themselves to sort of ally with the police and report on who the criminals are. And, and basically it becomes a, a new way of policing to survey these communities for the purposes of, of suppressing crime. Um, but, you know, community policing is essentially, it's counterinsurgency 101, right? It's, it's the kind of counterinsurgency tactics that have been developed since Vietnam, where you embed in the community and you get the community to inform on who the insurgents are and you get them to do policing themselves in a sense. Um, so that's one example that, I don't know, it gets directly to your question about psychological, but it is a, a different kind of mentality, but it's still connected to and drawn from, in many ways, counterinsurgency tactics. Thanks very much. Well, okay, everyone, I think we've got time for one last round of questions. Um, while any of you uh, think about your question, I'll quickly ask one as well. Um, and so please put your hand up uh, 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 while I'm speaking, if you'd like to come in. So, uh, Julian, I wanted to ask you a question about how you'd place your work in a wider conceptual and theoretical framework. Um, I was recently rereading Hazem Kandil's book on the Egyptian revolution, and he wants to extend Michael Mann's IEMP model, which argues that we need to divide, uh, you know, autonomous political power into seeing uh, the state and the military as both autonomous forms of power. And Candil's claim is that we actually need to further subdivide the police, uh, the, uh, the military component into the police and the military. And then he goes on to explain the crisis of the Mubarak regime by, uh, you know, looking at the competition struggle between the police, military uh, and the state. I suppose that to me, I'm interested because, I mean, the, the concept of the coloniality of policing, to my mind, sort of push back, pushes back on that. And so I'm just wondering what you think um, about your work. Like, what does your work say about how we should think about um, the police, you know, within the discipline of sociology? I suppose that if the very first question was asking you to relate your work to Marx, maybe this one is asking you to relate it to the Weberian tradition. And I can see that we actually have a question in the chat as well. Um, and this is from Tia. Uh, and she said, uh, and they say, hello, it's early morning in Indonesia. I have a simple question about the idea of civilized police. 
What do you think about the idea that lies on the concept? I mean, in relation to the police relationship with the civilians and the idea of funding police, authority and tools, including high tech from corporations. In Indonesian context, it's caused confusion, ramifications, confusal, confusion, also opportunities for abuses of power, for example, new forms of profiling. So that's two questions, and I don't have any other, although actually I am going to ask you the third, which is because Stephen Balto, sorry, Simon Balto, previously posted in the chat around the question uh, of the relationship between gender uh, 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 and the militarization of police and colonialism and so on, and he posted um, a book. Now, there wasn't a question in there, but I actually do think that it invites a question on what do you think are the gendered dynamics of, um, of the arguments you're making? Thank you. These are great questions. Um, let me take the question from Tia first. Thank you for this. Uh, I appreciate you listening all the way in Indonesia. Um, I mean, I, I don't have any clear uh, knowledge or in-depth knowledge of, of, of the Indonesia context that you're talking about. Um, I guess the way I would answer the question is um, is to unpack this category that you ask about in the beginning, which is the civil police. Now, the civil police, I, as I mentioned, is a model of policing that emerges. I'm 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 suggesting with the British police and then the Anglo-American, well, essentially the American police, and it is this ideal of the police being completely separate from the military. Um, and you know, one of my points is that this is an ideal. It doesn't really exist, but it is the ideal, it's the self-representation of the police in the United States and Britain and around the world, even though in contexts like Indonesia, I'm sure, and definitely in the Philippines in colonial context, the, the, the line between civil and military policing or the military and civil policing has always been porous. I mean, colonial regimes, there was really no, the distinction between policing and the military doesn't make any sense really. Um, and, and it doesn't really exist. And so, there's a sense in which um, this um, this civilized civil police has to be seen as an ideology that masks deeper connections between um, what we think of as the policing that's supposedly separate from the military. Um, and then the question about gender, I'll have to look at this book. It looks great. Um, and again, yeah, I, you know, the, the gender dynamics are things that I have to explore further, but there's definitely, when you're talking about the military, when you're talking about colonialism, there's always gender dynamics there that I think just need to be unpacked more. And I, I really um, um, don't have much more to say about it, except that what I mentioned earlier about how um, this sense of having to protect white women um, is, is one of the motivators for the, one of the triggers for Police militarization, which is a, you know a common trope, it's it's uh, used also in colonial arenas as well to justify colonialism. So um, I think gender is so is so bound up in all of this that it's actually very difficult to tease out um, without really giving it a sustained um, analysis. And I simply couldn't do justice to this. But this book um, by Angry Fisher looks looks amazing. And um, thanks Simon for uh, mentioning that. Um, so Peter, your question. <clears throat> I mean, the way I answered is, look, um, I, this maybe goes back to this point about the civil police. Uh, you know, sociologists for too long have thought about military um, and the state um, without thinking about policing. But policing is the domestic version of the military. It is, it claims the monopoly uh, of violence. It's, that's what makes police distinct from any other institution in the domestic sphere, in our society, right? It is. It is the one institution that can legitimately use violence against citizens right, and get away with it. Um, and that's its task. They're violence workers, um, as um, some police scholars say. So um, I think that that's the Weberian element that I would take in. I, I like from Weber, I would stress this violence aspect because it, it, it reminds us of what is unique about policing as an institution. It, just, it is the arm of the state for the domestic site and it uses the same tools as the military, which is the arm of the state overseas. And part of my argument about police militarization is that they're really kind of the same thing, right? They're very much the same institution. 
of violence, of the state of um, using violence um, and physical coercion. They, we just give them different names. We have the military and policing, but I think that theoretically, analytically, there's something to be gained by recognizing them as part policing and military as part of the same singular state apparatus. So hopefully that begins to address your very important sociological question. Absolutely. And are there any final comments you'd like to make just to, to sum up the conversation as a whole? No, I just want to thank everyone for participating. And it was a great pleasure to learn from you and to hear all your questions and to have this discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. Well, I'd like to thank you most of all. That was genuinely fascinating. Uh, for everyone, uh, please know that this has been recorded. We'll put it up on the Havens Right Centre website soon. And I imagine that there are lots of people that you would like to uh, share this talk with. So please do share it far and wide. Thank you all for attending. <coughs> Uh, just another reminder uh, that we have a social cinema series going on right now. Uh, we also have uh, several more talks next week. As I said, Anand Gopal and Anita Sridhar are talking on uh, uh, vaccine avoidance and the crisis of social, social solidarity. That's same time next week. Um, and I'd invite you all to come to that. But once again, please give a big round of applause virtually, unfortunately, uh, for Professor Go. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we all look forward to reading your books soon.